Hello, everyone. Allow me to say a few words before we start. So my name is Chris from G5. G5 is a venture capital firm from China. We invest in local startups and also running a global community for startup founders and investors to exchange ideas and experience. I want to thank Law Path Legal for today. Um, so they are legal legal tech companies, and uh, help startups and founder startup and founders and also investors. So don't forget to claim your free document, one free document for today for all of us. I also want to thank Zhongguan Chun Australia. Zhongguan Chun is one of the largest science park and innovation networks in from China. So if, we, if you want to explore the opportunity for China, talk to Ms. Yao sitting there later. So we all know that investment is one of the most challenging work in startup and uh, venture capital. So today we'll go through several uh, most important parts in this process from both entrepreneur's perspective and also investor's perspective. So let's invite Damon from Law Pass Legal who will do the presentation. Hello, thank you. So where's the deck? Yeah, where's the deck? Now I'm going to introduce Ryan just briefly. Ryan will come down and explain what Law Path is, and then we'll get into this in a moment. How many people know what Law Path is? Anyone? Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Ian. So thank you for everyone coming to tonight's event. I just wanted to start off and open the floor and talk about Law Path, uh, who we are and what we do. So the topic for tonight is on venture investment, uh, the legal essentials for fundraising and investing. Uh, but you might be asking, you know, what is Law Path? Who are we and how can we help you? So just on today's agenda, we're going to be going through a bit of Law Path, uh, a bit about Damon, and then we'll be going straight into capital raising for your business. Uh, towards the end, we will do question and answer time, so stick around for that as well. So just a bit about Law Path. Uh, we create and make uh, smart, simple legal for small businesses. So if you ever need legal documentation, templates, you need advice, uh, we are the firm to help you with that. Um, as you can see, we've served over 300,000 businesses. We've saved over $100 million in legal fees. We have over 10,000 five-star reviews as well. So I'll just head back to this one a bit. Um, how we do this is we allow the creation of legal documents to manage your compliance and connect with lawyers on demand in a single platform. So there's a multiple aspects to our platform. Firstly, as I mentioned, we have the documents library for templates. So we have about 350 of these templates on the platform, uh, whether you need employment agreements, uh, any form of standard of form agreements as well, uh, business registration, um, all these regular templates that you would find, so even company constitutions, trust documents, etc. These are all templates that are available on our platform, and they're all ratified to use in all Australian states and territories as well. So they're customizable for your business. Um, it saves you having to go to a solicitor and say, pay a few hundred dollars for a simple template. Um, but the other side of the business is where Damon comes in at Law Path Legal. Uh, we have our legal advice plan, which allows you to get unlimited 30-minute consultations with our lawyers, as well as our chartered accountants at Pop Business, and to ensure that you know it's a bit of a bridge, say, between just using the templates and getting the advice that you need for your business as well. Uh, getting your contracts reviewed, getting advice on things like employment, intellectual property, uh, capital raising, all these topics that, again, we cover through the plan, and we will be looking at capital investment tonight as well. So that's a bit about the program and the platform that we have. Uh, I'll be up at the back, so if anyone has any questions on Law Path and our platform and how we can help your small business or our plans, feel free to come and speak to me. Thank you. I'll pass it over to Damon. Okay, so I always like to know who I'm talking to. So I think the first thing is, 
how many people are looking for money? We're talking about money today. So how many people are trying to raise money or who is a startup? No? And how many people are investors looking to invest into startups? All right. Well, whether you're on either side of it, this is what we're talking about. So we're talking about what's the process to uh, invest into a company? What's the process of finding money and what you need to do to get people to invest in your business? And basically, the, the legal requirements and the documents that you generally use to facilitate that transaction. Now, I've been a lawyer for about 14 years, uh, primarily in corporate commercial law. So we do a lot of capital raising. We do a lot of transactions, mergers, acquisitions. And so we're going to start about the pre-investment stage. So the first thing as an investor, uh, when you're looking to invest into a startup, you want to make sure that all their paperwork is in order. And when I say paperwork is in order, they might have issued shares to random people. They might have uh, raised capital before. They might have some debt, so they might have borrowed money. And so part of that process is making sure that that company has all their documentation in order before you're investing into it. So you want to make sure that they've issued share certificates to people. If they have a loan, you want them to disclose that they have a loan so that you know that when you're investing money, your money is not going to be used to pay out someone else's money, uh, to pay out someone else's loan. You want your money that you're investing into a startup to go into the startup so that that money is then being used to grow the business, not to pay out someone else's debt. So when we look at raising capital in Australia, if you're a private company, you're not allowed to go onto WeChat and you're not allowed to go onto uh, Facebook or into the public domain and advertise, I'm selling shares. That's against the law in Australia. And we have something called an exemption, which is under Section 708 of the Corporations Act. But generally speaking, you can't just advertise to the public, I'm selling shares in my private company. Because if ASIC finds out, they'll slap you because you're not allowed to do it. So public companies, they are allowed to do it because they're highly regulated. And oftentimes, when you're going to buy shares on the ASX, you don't need to get look at any of the legal documents around it because of the regulation that's behind the private company or the public companies. But for private companies, you got to have legal documents in place, and you got to take it from either existing shareholders or employees of your business, or if you're going to do it to the general public, people that don't need disclosure. Now, people that don't need exposure is someone called a sophisticated investor. So let's just, let me just give an example. So if you're a startup company, you're looking for money, you can't just go and advertise it, but you can go to a sophisticated investor. And that's someone that makes more than $250,000 a year, and it used to be $500,000, and has more than $2.5 million of assets. And so those people are called sophisticated investors, and they don't need any disclosure documents. So they don't need a prospectus. So uh, as an example, you might have buy an insurance policy. In that insurance policy, it tells you about all the risks, all the exclusions, all the, all the um, what kind of claims you can bring. And these, this is a prospectus of all financial products. Needs a very comprehensive legal document that's many, many pages long. But if you're a sophisticated investor, you're not given any protections at all. As a sophisticated investor, if you invest, that's at your own risk. And so for private companies, they're the ones that are investing to, or they're, they're trying to find sophisticated investors, those people that are, are willing to take that risk, and they do their own due diligence to see whether um, that company is any good. Now, if we look at disclosure documents, we have a prospectus, information statement, and, uh, and then we have corporate bonds. So um, I, I like to give an example. I think there was a company called, it might have been Yoji on the ASX. There was a, a newly listed company on the ASX. I think it only had $200,000 revenue at the time. And so what they did is they lodged a prospectus with the ASX, and they said that we have contracts with fantastic furniture, 
way of contracts, and they started naming all these different companies in the prospectus. But what they didn't mention was that a lot of those people that they mentioned in the prospectus, they were uh, pilot programs, and none of those companies actually went ahead using the technology. So when all these investors and, and mom and dad individuals who saw the prospectus invested in, they were thinking that these guys had all these different um, companies using them. But then what happened to find out that they didn't. So they listed on the ASX, the stock went really high, and then it's crashed. And then what we've done is we have all these litigation-funded law firms from the U.S. mostly, Bird and Bird, and all these really big law firms from the U.S. who have now come to Australia, and they specialize in litigation funding and suing startups for misleading and deceptive prospectuses and information documents. So one of the things that we talk about is getting your disclosure documents correctly drafted if you're going to use it. But as I mentioned, if you're a small startup, you don't need a disclosure document at all if you're taking money from a sophisticated investor. So let's talk about what kind of investment are you going to get if you're a startup or what kind of document you're going to use if you're an investor looking to invest into a company. And the different things that you normally look at is, well, has this company raised money before? If they've raised money before, then what did they use that money for? Have they used that money to build technology? Have they used that money to hire a salesperson to get their brand off the ground? And if they have, did you see the company increase? Has the company generated revenue from the past investment that they've received? Then you want to look at, well, if they haven't raised any money, they're what we call pre-revenue, and you're going to be a seed investor. So you're the first one that's going to come in, and they might not have anything at all. They might just have an idea, or they might have someone that's a software developer who has been sitting in their bedroom for three years drafting away and drafting up some code, and now they're trying to get it to market, but they don't have anyone who is... Uh, willing to put money in, so you're the first one that's going to put that money in so that they can now commercialize the technology. And so depending on what stage the company is depends on what document we're going to be using when we make that investment. And then you look at whether they have revenue, and then there's anything else that might be relevant. Now, if you're a pre-revenue company, so if you just have a technology or you just have a minimum viable product, for instance, then normally you're going to be doing what's called a simple agreement for future equity. And I'll talk about what that is, but it's a very simple four-page contract. As an investor, it doesn't give you very much protection. As a startup, it gives you um, not a lot of obligations. So it's normally a really safe document to give to your friends and family. The way it works is it basically says, I'm going to invest $100,000 into this startup company. But the startup company doesn't know what it's worth. So because it doesn't know what it's worth, it's not going to sell its shares right now because it doesn't know what its valuation is. So the agreement is, I'll take your $100,000 and I will issue you shares later at the next equity financing round, which means I will take your $100,000 now. I promise that I will issue you shares later, but the shares that I'm going to issue later to you is based on what the next investor invests at. So for instance, let's say, plus a discount. So for instance, I invest $100,000 now. We then are in a situation where we're going to use that money. We're going to grow the business. Once we grow it, we're then going to go and try to find real investors and raise a million dollars. And when we go and raise a million dollars, we will then give you shares at that time. Now, in the future, when they raise that million dollars, the company might be worth $10 million. And so the initial $100,000 that was invested will get converted at a $10 million valuation with a 20% discount, which means the shares that this original investor gets not actually at a $10 million valuation, but it's at an $8 million valuation. So the initial investor gets a benefit 
to the future investors. The benefit for a startup is that you can just sit and wait and just grow your business without any pressures to perform anything, without any pressures to uh, issue any shares at a valuation that you just simply don't know. And a lot of times you don't know what your company is worth until you actually get to market, until you actually start selling and, and uh, having a product that is sellable, you might not know what your company is actually worth. And if you value your company at the beginning at a very low value, then you're giving away all this equity to a new investor uh, and you're diluting your own shareholding down as a founder quite significantly. So you might only value your company at one million, but it's actually worth five. And if you had it just waited six months, you would have known it was worth five. So that's why we use a simple agreement um, for future equity. Now the next one's a convertible note. A convertible note is a really dangerous document for a startup, but a great document for an investor. And what that says is, I'm going to invest $100,000 in this startup business, and I'm going to have a maturity date. So in two years, I get to decide whether my $100,000 converts into shares, or I get my money back, and it's a loan. So in that, in that circumstance, as an investor, you get to choose whether you get shares in the business or whether you get your money back plus interest. The downside for a startup, though, is that if a startup enters into an agreement with an investor who gets to choose whether they get shares or their money back in two years, most of the time, the only reason an investor wants their money back is because the company's not doing anything. And if they convert into shares, those shares aren't going to be worth as much as they thought they were going to be. So what that means now is that the startup has to pay back this investor, but they don't have the money. So they then have to go and find another investor who's willing to put money in to pay out a debt. And what I said originally is no one wants to put money into a company to pay out someone else's debt. And so what happens is that you end up in a, in a difficult situation where a convertible note can actually bring down a startup completely because they can't raise money to clear out a debt. And no one wants to invest into a company that, that their money is not being used to grow it, but instead their money is being used to pay out someone else's debt. And then the other one is issuing shares immediately. And, and, and if you're going to issue shares immediately to someone, um, that's great, but you want to make sure that you're valuing your business correctly. And a lot of times as a startup, you don't know what your business is actually worth. And that's where these two come in because you can say that the convertible note converts at the next uh, equity financing round. You can say this converts at the next equity financing round based on a valuation that's set in the future. Whereas this one, you're, you're issuing shares now and you might be underselling your business. Now, when you issue shares, um, you never transfer shares from one person to another. So let's say you have 100 shares and you want to give someone 10% of your business. You would think, oh, okay, well, I will take 10 shares and I'll transfer that to this investor who's going to put 100,000 in. But if you think about it, it's actually they're not investing into the company because what's happening is that the shareholder that owns the, 10, or the 100 shares is selling 10 of them personally to an investor. And that investor is personally paying the shareholder $100,000. And that money never actually goes to the company at all. That money actually goes to the shareholder, and then the shareholder ends up paying capital gains tax. Because when they incorporated their company, they might have incorporated it for one cent per share, and now they're selling 10 shares for 100,000. So when we issue shares, we always issue more shares, we don't transfer shares to avoid capital gains tax, and to make sure that the money actually goes in the company. So the company issues more shares and that the people buy the shares off of the company. And so the capitalization table, that shows who the shareholders are, how many shares there are, and what percentage of shareholding those people will end up having. And then you might hear the word um, fully diluted. That means that you show the number of shares that exist now, you show how many safe notes and convertible notes 
um, are there and how many shares those will convert into in the future to show what the new investor is going to get on a fully diluted basis as if all the shares have been issued. Now, we've already gone through a simple agreement for future equity, but that's the best for a startup. It's probably the worst for an investor. And convertible notes is the best for an investor, but not so great for a startup. And allocating new shares is the best for everybody. And the reason why it's best for everybody is it gives a definitive answer to what you're actually going to get. And that's where we start talking about, well, what legal documents are you going to use when you become a shareholder? And the main thing is a shareholder's agreement and a constitution. Now, a shareholder's agreement will say, um, who has a right to appoint a director? What major decisions get decided and how they get decided? So do the directors make the decisions or do the shareholders make the decisions? Um, you have what's called a drag-along clause and you have a tag-along clause. So drag-along clause saying, I have a company, I've just got an amazing offer and I'm going to sell my business to this person. But the problem is you might have some minority shareholders who hold shares and they refuse to sell them. And now you can't sell your whole business because there's a couple shareholders holding out. So you can sell 98% of the business, but you can't sell the other two. So a shareholders agreement forces the minority shareholders to also sell, to allow you to sell the whole business. And then the other main thing about a shareholders agreement is a dispute resolution clause. Now, if you have a fight as a shareholder, as an investor with the company, the only jurisdiction in Australia is the Supreme Court of each state. And the minute I mention the Supreme Court, it means at least $3,000 filing fee. You're going to need at least five to 10000 for a lawyer. And you're going to need a barrister for another 10, at least 10000 So the minute you mention Supreme Court is about twenty five grand. Now, and, and that's the only way you can do anything. So for instance, if you just wanted to look at the financial records of the company, if you don't have a right in your shareholders agreement to get access to the financial records, you've got to bring an application under Section 247A of the Corporations Act that gives that convinces the court that you have a good reason why you need to look at those documents and you have to spend 25 grand to get access to the financial records of the company. Or you could have a shareholders agreement that just says, I will get the financial records of the company every quarter. So that's the importance of having a shareholders agreement and a constitution sets out what different class of shares exists. So I can explain all the different cases I've had in every single different court across the country, but I am normally in a dispute about this and this or where those two don't exist. And one example is I had a, a client who went and he was going to go and buy into a big property development. So he saw a really beautiful glossy magazine and it said you're going to get A-class shares if you invest one million, but we'll give you M-class shares if you invest three million. So my client said, oh, well, I'm going to invest $3 million so I get M-class shares. So he went and he invested the $3 million, he got his shares, and then a year or two later down the line, he was trying to figure out, well, what's happened with his investment and so on. So I started doing some searches, and they ended up just loading up the company with debt. So they, they took the initial money, but that wasn't enough money to build the construction. So they ended up having to get short-term money lenders to, who ended up actually just putting debt on the company and he ended up getting nothing. But one of the main things he was telling me, he says, well, that's not fair. I told I was going to get M-class shares, but I only got A-class shares. And I said, well, what is A-class shares? He said, I don't know. I said, well, what's M-class shares? He's like, I don't know. And I said, so how can you tell the court that they misled you and deceived you about you getting M or getting A-class shares instead of M-class shares when you don't even know what they mean? They could have just changed the name of the share but you actually don't know what rights it gives you. And the Constitution is what dictates what the rights, what rights you get. So a lot of times when you're an investor and you have a little bit of power, you end up investing into preference shares. And the standard in preference shares is saying maybe you have uh, information rights. Maybe you get access to the books and records. But the main thing is um, what's called uh, anti-dilution clauses. So I'm not sure if you've heard of anti-dilution. 
you know, there was a movie about Facebook and things like that talking about preference shares. But anti-dilution doesn't mean that the investor will never go down. So if an investor invests and gets 20% of the business, it doesn't mean that they keep 20% of the business all the time. What it means in Australia is that it's an anti-dilution down round, which just means that if I'm investing at a million dollar investment, you're not going to go tomorrow and sell the shares at a $500,000 investment. So if you're going to go raise money, you're going to raise it more. And if you do end up raising money at a $500,000 valuation, you're going to top me up as if I invested at that $500,000. No, that's something different. I'll get into that. But that, this is just the preference shareholders. It's a special uh, document you normally put into a constitution, and it's a schedule to the constitution that dictates what the terms of a preference share is. Yeah, sure. Um, another question is, um, if you do go um, for litigation um, because of like, no disclosure for this key definition, for example, the M class or A class shares or something like that, um, if you win in the Supreme Court and I spend like uh, 25 grand, um, do you get a court order to get a money back? Yeah, normally if you're bringing an action against a company to get access to books and records of the company or something like that, you'll normally get your cost back. Okay. And you'll normally get around somewhere between 50 and 70 percent. Okay. So if you spend 100,000 legal fees, you're only going to get somewhere between 50 and 70, and 70 you, back, you, so you're still, going to, you're still going to be out of pocket. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing about a preference share is you normally get what's called uh, liquidation preference. So that is if the company ends up um, being sued and a liquidator is appointed, the liquidator then pays himself, he then pays out the employee entitlements and the secured creditor, someone that's the lender, uh, and then if there's any money left over, it goes to unsecured creditors and then it goes to the shareholders. But for a preference shareholder, it goes first, the initial investors, they get their money back. And once they've got their money back, then only the other shareholders possibly get some dividends. Now, the difference between a company constitution and a shareholders agreement is that when you have a constitution, you're, entering, you're, you're buying shares that are governed by this one document, and if you want to enforce it, you've got to sue the company. Whereas with a shareholders agreement, you're entering an agreement with all of the shareholders. So if one shareholder goes and sells their shares and didn't offer you an opportunity to buy those shares, which is a preemptive right, you can sue that shareholder, or you can stop them from selling it. Uh, so it, it gives you an opportunity to be able to um, keep the other shareholders honest and compliant with the shareholders agreement. Or even, um, normally a shareholders agreement also has uh, non-competition clauses, restraint of trade clauses, uh, confidentiality, things like that. So the shareholders agreement, generally speaking, the main thing is um, who can appoint a director, what the rights are in the actual, for the kind of shares you're getting. But a constitution's always overwritten by a shareholders agreement. There's always a clause that says, if there's any inconsistency between this document, then a shareholders agreement prevails. Now, a shareholders agreement, this is where we normally do what's called founders' rights. So I don't know if you've ever heard of founders' rights, but if you have a startup and you want to protect it, um, and you don't want to just get kicked out of your company once you take investment in, you can put into this agreement that says, well, as long as I have 10% ownership of this company, I can always appoint a director to my business. And if there's certain big decisions that are going to be made, I get the right to veto those decisions. So I can't force a decision across, but I can, uh, if, they want, if the company wants to issue shares, they need approval from me. If they want to raise capital, they need approval from me. If they want to um, enter into lease, they need approval from me. If they want to hire new staff, they need approval from me. If they want to borrow money, they need approval from me. And so you put all these conditions in that gives the founder the protection so that they can't just get kicked out. And then normally then, once you have a shareholders agreement that has these founders right, when the investor comes in, in Australia, they normally say, that's fine, we don't have a problem but we get the same rights. 
And so then the investor comes in and takes the exact same rights as the founder. And those are the rights that are in the shareholders agreement that gives the investor the same thing. You can't make decisions without my approval. You have my money. I don't want you to spend it unless you comply with, with the business plan. And if you're going to go outside of the business plan, you need my permission on how you're going to spend your money. Now, so once you have got a shareholder, so if, you've, if you're going to be issuing shares, once you have a shareholders agreement in place, once you have a constitution drafted up, the next thing is then to sell your shares. And that's what you use a subscription agreement or an application form for. Now, a subscription agreement basically says, you're going to invest X amount of dollars, and we're going to issue X amount of shares. And on completion, we will, you're going to sign, the investor is going to sign the shareholders agreement, and we're going to issue a share certificate to you. We're going to update our, our share registry to show you as a shareholder of our business. We're going to notify ASIC that, we're, that you're a shareholder of the business. And, uh, and then we might get a resolution from uh, the other shareholders or from the other directors appointing the investor as a director to the company, for instance. So that's all spelt out, and all the steps are spelt out in a subscription agreement. And, that, and in addition to that, a subscription agreement normally also gives certain warranties. So as an investor, you don't want to sign one of these in a private company. You want to sign one of these in a private company. Because this also has what's called warranties. And you can get the founders to give certain warranties and the company. So you can say, um, you can get the founder to promise that they have the legal right to issue shares. There's no one stopping them from issuing the shares. When they issue the shares, you will own them completely. They have no debt. They have no judgments. They paid all their employees in accordance with the, with the relevant laws. They've paid all superannuation contributions. They have no tax owing. They, have, they own all their intellectual property. And, and you can get all these warranties where they promise everything. So a lot of times you don't need to do a lot of due diligence because the founder is giving all these warranties. And if any of these warranties are breached, then you can sue the founder and take their shares, and now you can have more of the company. Or you can sue the company and ask for your money back because what they promised you is a lie. And when you look at a contract, you have terms and conditions, but warranties are really, really strong. Warranties. If you see a warranty clause in the agreement, that is a promise that is absolute. And if someone breaches that, that will be an absolute breach of the contract, and it will likely entitle you to get your money back as a result of that breach. So that's going to be contained in a, subs in a subscription agreement. Now, if you're a startup, you don't want to give any of those warranties. And if you do have to give warranties, you just want the company to give warranties, but not the founder. And so that's the difference where a lot of founders don't want to give the warranties. All the investors want the actual person behind the business to give these promises. Now, the other way to raise capital is by debt. And people are getting really creative in terms of debt and how they can uh, raise money by debt. I have a client, very large client. They're getting lots and lots of money. And they're creating new ways to lend money. So, some of the things is research and development grants. Have you guys ever heard of the R&D tax incentive? So somewhere about 43.5 cents for every dollar spent on R&D, you get paid back by the government. So they actually pay you cash. It's not offset against your tax returns. It's actually cash that they pay you. So if you're developing something like technology, you want to be keeping a record of everything you're developing and all the time you're spending and all the money you're spending, because you can put an application in to get a research and development grant and get that 40, almost half of it back. Now, I have a client that lends people money and says, grow your business as fast as you can. I will lend you a lot of money, and I'll get my money back from the research and development grant that comes back. We also, they also go and they say, well, you have an annual subscription. LawPath has an annual subscription, for instance. They will look at what the annual subscription amount is, or maybe it's a monthly subscription. They'll look at what revenue you're uh, anticipated to get in the next 12 months, and they'll lend that entire amount to you as a loan, and you sell 
the subscription to the lender. And if you don't pay it back, then they get to go after all the other people that owe the money. But there's just different ways. There's trade finance and things like that. Now, one of the things is normally when you're borrowing money or if you want to lend money, you can get a loan agreement, but your a loan agreement isn't great. It's not a great document because it says, I'm going to lend you $100,000, and if you don't pay me back by this date, I get the $100,000 back. Now, what will happen is that if that's all it says, then the only way you're going to get your $100,000 back is if you actually sue in court and get a judgment against that company. Now, it's going to cost you probably $100,000 to get a judgment in court because they're going to file defense and make up some excuse why they're not giving your money back. So you can become a secured creditor by getting what's called a general security deed. So if you lend the $100,000 by loan, you can get another document called a general security deed. And that is an extremely powerful document. That document basically says that if you breach the loan agreement or you commit an insolvency event or if you borrow money from anybody else without getting your approval or you issue shares or you change ownership or you do anything or you sell your assets, then that will automatically trigger a breach and they can appoint a receiver. And what that means is they can appoint an accountant to walk into the business, change the locks on the door, kick everybody else, repossess all the assets, sell the assets, give the lender the money back and then give the keys back to the owner. So it's, and you can do it sometimes without notice. So I've had cases where a receiver just walks straight in the door and says, I'm coming to repossess items until I get my client's money back. So it's, that's, if you're gonna do a loan agreement, do a general security deed on top of that. Now a general security deed is, the main power is through the Personal Property Securities Act. So if you were to go and buy a car and you get finance on your car, the car's in your name, but if anyone does a search on that vehicle, you'll see that that vehicle has a charge against it in the name of the financier's business. And so what happens is that if you went to go try to sell your car, someone could do a simple search and see that there's finance on it, and they won't buy your vehicle. You can do the same thing with companies. So if you loan the money and you have a general security deed, you can lodge a charge against the company that you lent money to, which now means that if a liquidator is appointed or someone's appointed to, to sell the assets, they'll see that you're the first registered security holder over the assets and the liquidator is not allowed to touch anything. They actually call you up and say, you, you hold all the assets, uh, so we can't do anything without your approval. So it's an extremely powerful, and you have to lodge a PPSA registration within 21 days from signing the agreement. So I guess the, at the end of the day, the question is whether you're going to do a safe note, convertible note, issue shares, or do a loan. Um, it's entire, every situation is different. So uh, anyone have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. No, that's totally different. So I'll explain how an employee share scheme works, which is quite interesting because there's, I always say there's three ways to give shares to an employee. So you could issue a safe note. So that's one way of saying thank you for working in our business. We're going to give you um, X amount of shares. But that's normally going to be picked up as income tax on the employee side of things because what happens is that you might give them you have to make up a figure of how much they're investing. So they might be on a $100,000 salary, but they're worth $120,000. So you might give them a safe note for $20,000. The ATO will deem that as $20,000 income, and they could get hit with an income tax. So we, there's, there's a couple ways to do it, um, but the main one is employee share scheme. And in 2015, the ATO came up with a new way to give shares to employees. And it basically says that you create a plan. And the plan basically says, it has, sets out all the rules. 
and then you have a letter of offer that you give to an employee and you, you normally say um, you work in the business and it's what's called vesting condition. So you work in the business for four years. Over the next four years, there's 48 months. And month on month, you're going to earn one divided by 48 of the number of shares that we're willing to give you, which is the number of options. And so then they work in the business, and then when they complete that, there's an entitlement for them to convert their option into a share. And they have to pay what's called the exercise price, which is a payment. But for the empl regulated employee share plan, that exercise price that the employee has to pay is not the actual price per share. It's based on what's called the asset test. And the asset test is just the value of the assets in the business at the time the letter of offer was issued. And a lot of companies don't actually have a lot of assets. Most of it's their revenue or their, their, um, you know, their intellectual property, but it's been developed and so on. So the, that gives them the benefit of not having to pay a lot of money to convert into shares. Uh, but also, they get a 50% capital gains tax concession. So if you set the exercise price of your business is not worth anything at one cent, then later on they convert to a share and sell that share for $10. There's $9.99 capital gains tax. They get a 50% concession to what the normal capital gains tax rate would be. Now you can also, so the benefit of that is you can give a lot of employees this, they get a big tax benefit. But the disadvantage is it's not that incentivizing all the time because a lot of times, an employee actually never gets a share in the company. They have these options that have a right to convert into a share. And even though they've worked for four years and their share has vested, or their options vested, the only time that they're normally actually allowed to convert their option into a share is at an exit event when the business sells. And the reason for that is that as a company, you don't want all these ex-employees and all these little shareholders throughout your company because if you have all these little shareholders, it's very hard to move. You can't amend your shareholders agreement, you can't amend the constitution, you gotta hold board or general meetings of shareholders to get decisions across. Um, and so what happens is that you, you end up just saying, well, you can't become a shareholder. You have the right to get shares at an exit event and when we sell our business, you convert, the buyer buys that off of you and then you get a big windfall. Now, if you want to hire like a board of advisors or, or very senior C-level employees, you might give them an unregulated um, employee share plan, which is very similar. It's saying um, you've got to work in the business. You slowly earn those, earn those options. We'll, we'll convert to shares. And then they pay a price for those uh, to convert. But they can convert whenever they want, and they become a shareholder. And you can normally give, but they don't get the tax benefit from that. And you've got to be careful of possibly that being income tax. So you don't write into an employment contract. Your normal salary would be $180,000, but we're only going to give you $120,000 plus these options. You normally want the options to run with uh, loyalty, time served, rather than sacrifice of salary or something like that. Yeah, so depends on how you draft your employee share plan, but you can, we normally have what's called a good lever and a bad lever provision. A good lever provision says if you resign within three years, everything laps. If you're terminated uh, because of redundancy, you get to keep what you've earned, you lose what you haven't earned. Um, if you are a bad lever because you committed fraud on us, you lose everything. If you uh, competed us against us or store clients, you lose everything. So you just draft up these different clauses that dictate what people do get and what they do, don't get at the end. And you can do that in the regulated employee share plan, but you can also do that in a normal one for your C-level. And then the third way is what's called reverse vesting. And that's saying, I've, I've known this CTO for a long time, I wanna go into business with them, or founders joining a business together 50-50, or maybe three of them at the same, they go in at the very beginning, they all get, they all get 33%. So let's say there's three shareholders, um, there are three founders, they've paid nothing for their shares. 
the reason why they paid nothing in their shares is probably because the intention is that they have to work in the business. And we deal with this all the time where someone started a business with three shareholders and then someone's quit. Or one is doing all the work and no one's doing anything else. So we, this is what we call reverse vesting where we give everybody the shares now, they're all issued those shares, they all have a right to appoint a director, they all have the right to dividends, they all get the right to vote, they have, for all intents and purposes they have the right to the shares. But if they're a bad lever or a good lever, they will lose their shares and, and you can cancel or buy back the shares that uh, they haven't earned. So you still have vesting conditions which is you have to work in the business for the next four years and you'll earn one divided by 48 month on month. So if you quit after two years, you get to keep half of your shares, but the other half you lose. But that's in the shareholders agreement and that's how you enforce it that way. Yeah, so section 708 of the Corporations Act is a small offer exemption. It says that a startup is allowed to offer up to $2 million worth of shares to 20 investors who are not sophisticated. Um, and so what that means is uh, you don't need a disclosure document, which we were talking about before, um, but you can also just, in a safe note or, or anything, Anything that's a financial product, anything that's a security falls under the Corporations Act and you need, but under this Section 708, this is what allows you to sell to friends and family and people that are known to you. So there's four different main definitions in this section. One is a sophisticated investor, one's a professional investor, like a stockbroker, um, and then one is an employee or a family member of, an employee, of a senior staff. And the other one is a professional connection. Someone that, let's say you have a friend who's a stockbroker, and you've told that stockbroker that you're selling shares in your business. That stockbroker can then tell their clients, and as long as their clients have specified that they're looking for investment opportunities, then they can go and be introduced. So there, but there still has to be a professional connection. But that's where that exemption applies. And when you look at the two million and the 20 investors, if you're a sophisticated investor, you're not counted in that number of investors. You're not counted in the tw 2 million or the 20. Uh, and if you're going to take sophisticated investor money, you need a certificate from an accountant. It's what's called the strict liability. So if you think someone's a sophisticated investor because what car they drive or whatever, and you take money from them and they're not, you have to give the money back. There's no defense. So you need to get a certificate from an accountant and the accountant signs off and says they're sophisticated. So, um, under um, the exception that you mentioned, the section 708, um, so to what extent, if they prepare the um, prospectus or the, like, met the minimum requirement of the disclosure, um, like the prospectus, uh, can they, I mean, the proprietary company, can they advertise in public? Yeah, you can. It's, it's pretty rare for startups because it's so expensive to get a prospectus drawn up. And you normally have an AFSL holder. So you normally have like a capital raiser who has an Australian financial services license yeah, so of who helps prepare the prospectus. Oh, okay. And then they're the ones that make the advertisement. And they're the ones that go through the process of collecting the money yeah. and making sure that these people are, well, they don't have to be sophisticated if you have a proper prospectus in place. Yeah, so speaking of being expensive, you mean um, preparing the prospectus needs to be in compliance with all the requirements so that's expensive yeah. or it has to go... Yeah, it can be like seventy to $100,000. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah, yeah. say the last one question is um, um, regarding the PPSR. Do you need another side assistance so to do the registration or you can do it on your own? Yeah, you can just go to ppsr.org.au, I think. Okay, it's just yeah. a government with, website. With long women and also the trustee yeah. Oh, yeah. and yeah. security. Uh, so what if you did not like, register in, uh, with PPSR and you rely on common law? Is that possible? 
uh, you, you'll still have all the rights that are granted in the documents, but you might not be able to defeat a liquidator. And the main purpose of it is that if a liquidator comes in the business, you want to point a receiver over that liquidator. You want to be able to say, well, you can't touch anything and I'm going to yeah, kick you out. that's why right? like I, I say, yeah. is that a possible to, to claim a common law? Under common law, is that a charge? Yeah, you can have a common law charge. Yeah, if I got a common law charge, I still have the priority. Like, you could, the, yeah. Like yeah, creditor. yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, but the powers of the liquidator might overpower your, your documents, potentially. Uh -huh. um, and, and on that note, a lot of people, when they structure their business, they might do a holding company, and all their intellectual property is owned by the holding company, and then they license it down to the trading company. So that if anything ever happened to that trading company, they could just close it down, gut it, or gut, gut all the assets, pull it back up to the holding company, close it down, start another business. But a liquidator can overlook related party transactions, and that's a related party transaction. So if it's a related party, you don't necessarily get to vote at a liquidator's meeting. But if you register a PPSR on behalf of the holding company over your trading company, pursuant to a PPSR clause in a license agreement, then again, you're the security, you're the secured, and you can defeat a liquidator. Yeah, so there's one, docu there's one document that I've missed um, or haven't mentioned. It's called a term sheet. Yeah. And a term sheet basically says, I'm interested in your business. Um, I want to know more. And, I'm, and it, you're saying your business is worth $10 million, And I'm saying I'm willing to invest one. But uh, we'll sign off on this document. You will we'll, we'll promise the confidentiality. And you're going to let me do due diligence on your company. And, and essentially, you give them a list, which is called the due diligence list. And they create a Dropbox or, or a data room. And they have to go through and upload all their documents in accordance with that list and answer all your questions to enable you to then go through and do your due diligence. And only then do you then go and draft up the shareholders agreement and the constitution and the subscription agreement after your due diligence is done. And normally, as part of that, is all the bank records, possibly even access to the bank accounts to look at them. Um, there's different software to extract the soft to extract the bank statements as well. Um, so I think. So what you're saying is they give you the um, like authority to go through all these most of the time. So they like they all like give you all the documents. Yeah, like yeah. Mo most of the time they will, but if they don't. In your subscription agreement, you say everything in the data room is correct. If there's anything missing or purposely missed, then that's a breach of a warranty. And if we find out, we will... That would be too late, right? Could be, it could be too late. That's right. And then that would possibly get into fraud. Like if someone's being sued or they have a huge debt and they, they didn't mention it to you at all, you can probably go to the Supreme Court and seize the bank accounts. And that's what's called an injunction. So if there was something so fundamental, you could probably go and ask the judge to seize all assets and not let them do anything, um, and, and, write it, and then seize all the bank accounts as well, if that was so severe. But I think that's the problem with due diligence, is that if you're going to do it, they could hide things from you, and you've got to be very careful. Instant. Instant. Yeah. As long as you submit your so you, so you go and you put your application. It's called an ex parte application. You don't tell the other side you're doing it. You can walk straight up to the court. So I'm doing one this week, yeah. or next week. Um, and basically, you, you make an application. You have an affidavit explaining what the background is. And then you just write to it, the court. And you say, I want to see a judge today. I want to see a judge in a couple hours. And then, well, then what happens is that you then go in, you explain it, 
the judge makes an order seizing everything. It's called a freezing order. It freezes everything. Um, and then you take that order and you send it, and all the banks have this special email, and you send that to all the different banks, and then they put a stay on all the bank accounts, and then you take that document and you give it to the person, and if they try to do anything, they contempt, it's a contempt of court, and go to jail. And the bank can do it like a, without informing the other party. That's right, they have to because it's court order. Right. Yeah. yeah, all right. Thank you, Danny, for going through that very comprehensive overview. I just wanted to jump in and talk about how LawPath can help. So you've probably heard a lot about, um, you know, Damon's gone into a lot of the agreements, a lot of the procedures, and just from looking at the Q&A, this is a very complex topic that is uh, really great to get advice on. Um, so in terms of LawPath and how we can help, I guess just firstly, we did a survey <coughs> of our customers, uh, and what they've told us is that Around 87% of individuals and more than 87% of SMBs, they find it difficult to access the legal services that they need. Um, not only is it they find it's hard or it's inaccessible, it uh, can take a long time, it can be expensive and it's complicated as well. And there's a general perception that uh, you might not be at the level to get uh, legal advice or you might just stay on the templates level when you can be getting a lot more advice that's custom for your business. And that's where we come in at LawPath. So we do have a contract management for your business. Um, like Damon mentioned, we do have a safe agreement on the platform, a shareholders agreement, a partnership agreement. There is uh, 360 documents which we're adding to monthly. And these documents are customizable no matter what state you're in. Uh, the system will ask you a lot of questions as well, uh, specifically on these equity agreements. We've got a term sheet, uh, et cetera, to kind of pre-populate and pre-fill these agreements for you. Uh, we do have personalized workflows as well. So whether you're looking to uh, you know, hire an employee, you're looking to set up a family trust, uh, a range of different legal activities, these workflows will walk you through the legal and the non-legal steps and go through each of it, directly linking you to the documents so that you're able to, I guess, have a bit of a bridge between getting lawyers and just using the documents. And then lastly, booking in legal consultations. Uh, so this is where you can book in to uh, speak to a lawyer like Damon. We've got Sam as well up the back. A uh, bunch of consulting lawyers on our platform. Now, usually within 24 to 48 hours, you can be speaking to them about your legal issue and, and get contract review as well. Um, so it's a great resource to have. Uh, just on our plans as well, on our legal advice plan, not only do you get unlimited 30-minute calls on our platform, uh, this is our accelerator program. So it's something that we've been developing over the last few months. And what it includes is six different topics here uh, on different areas of your business. And the whole idea is to provide a holistic overview uh, of different areas of your business. So uh, topic one covers around reviewing your business structure. Uh, particularly as you come into raising capital and equity, if you're a sole trader or a partnership or you've got different structures of trust, it can be really wise uh, to look at this and to review your structure before you go out and raise investment. Topic two is on protecting your brand and your intellectual property. So we have a range of dedicated IP lawyers on the platform who look at trademarks, they look at all kinds of different uh, things around IP, uh, such as you know what clauses you have in your agreements to ensure that if you do go out and raise investment, um, you know, you have the fundamentals right because investors may not touch your business if you haven't protected the basics uh, through a lot of the agreements you have. Thirdly, we will audit your employee agreements and policies with your lawyers. So especially when you're raising capital, um, again, this is one of the most fundamental topics to get right to ensure that you're protecting your IP and you're holding and retaining a lot of that. So our lawyers will go through uh, the intellectual property uh, in your employment agreements, but just making sure that you're compliant with the award, are you treating employees as employees and not as contractors and the like. Topic four will be on reviewing your supplier and commercial agreements. Uh, topic five will be on auditing your privacy and insurance policies uh, to ensure that you're compliant and that you're getting a good deal and you're staying protected. And lastly, how to get capital raising ready. So this is probably all the steps are leading up to topic six today. Um, which is what Damon shared and a lot of you if you're looking to raise investment or maybe you're not looking to do it now But in the future these are all different topics that our lawyers can sit down with and go through and review holistically to ensure that you're compliant So just in terms of our plans and what we offer we have three different plans available We have our essentials plan here on the left uh, What this one is it's 360 different legal documents that are fully customizable So the safe agreement the term sheet for seed investment 
uh, employment agreements, intellectual property agreements, they're all on the platform and customizable. Um, you can also white label these with your business's branding and use our e-signature feature. So you might be paying another platform um, for e-signature, there's no need to duplicate and you can use it for your documents as well as our documents. Now in terms of our legal advice plan, uh, this is the best value plan and one of the most popular ones that we have. And this is where you do get unlimited 30 minute calls every month to speak to our lawyers uh, such as Damon and Sam uh, on all these different topics that I've mentioned, uh, including the accelerator program. Uh, it does include on-call legal contract reviews as well, up to four pages. So if you have a range of different agreements that you've taken from our platform and you wanna get the lawyers to look over it and ensure that you're compliant, um, this is definitely the plan for you. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, we have our legal and accounting advice plan as well. So this includes everything that the legal advice plan covers. However, it does include uh, unlimited 30-minute calls with our chartered accountants. So we do have a relationship uh, with Pop Business. Uh, they're a highly accredited firm. So if you have any questions around, say, asset protection, group structuring, uh, minimizing your tax, or just figuring out how to structure your tax affairs, um, this is a phenomenal plan for that. Uh, also because the lawyers and accountants speak to each other on your business. So they're both across what you're dealing with and this is a very rare thing to get in the market. One more thing that we have on this plan as well is it has ASIC and ATO agent service. So if you ever need company changes to be filed with ASIC, such as a change of directorship or a registered address, this is something that our, can, our team can do for you and it just saves you having to go to ASIC directly and make these changes. One more product that we have as well is our virtual office. So especially for startups, um, you know, if you don't want to give your office address out, particularly if you're working from home or you want to simplify your process of receiving mail, this virtual address product allows you to use our office address here at LawPath as your company's registered address. So the benefit of this is it allows you to receive uh, all your mail here, our team, go through the mail and upload it daily to the platform where you'll get an email immediately informing you of that mail. Um, but if there's any documents that require a signature, you can sign it on our platform and submit it and that ensures that your document is signed uh, without having to do all the manual process as well. So we do have a special offer today on our virtual office product offering. It's $100 off the annual plan, uh, which brings it to around $17 a month. Uh, one of the cheapest virtual office products in Australia, if not the cheapest. Um, so again, could be an incredible service for your business. So I'll just pass it back to Damon. If you have any questions uh, on today's presentation or on the special offer that we have or any of our products and services, I'll be around here and up the back and uh, Damon will take the rest of the questions now. Any other questions? Uh, a lot of the time, we don't bother with the, the Constitution. Uh, but the thing is, you know, I'm the first uh, shareholder. Mm. I, I've made an amendment, I think, on my shareholder agreement. I'm happy with mm. the second shareholder comes in, sign up, another Another amendment. Yeah, so, how can yeah, so what, what happens is we, it's called a, an amended and reinstated, or reinstated um, shareholders agreement. So each round that you do, you will have a shareholders agreement and constitution, and the main lead investor will normally negotiate changes. And then, and then you, you go and change it, and you have to get all the previous shareholders to sign it. And then you go, and then you raise capital again, and another lead investor comes in, and they want all these special rights, you amend it again, and then you got to get all the shareholders signed again. Yeah, okay. Now, one of the things that you want to do normally is what's called an amendment clause. And it normally says that you don't need all the shareholders to approve it. So you can say any shareholder um, who has less than 2% shareholding must accept it automatically. 
and by everybody else signing this, you're bound by it. Or but that, that clause has to exist at the beginning when the initial shareholder comes in. So normally we have a clause that says this shareholders agreement can be amended by 80% of the shareholders signing some, something, and that will automatically be binding on everybody. Yeah. Well, technically, you're going to be probably safest with it in the Constitution because if it's in the Constitution, it can't be varied unless you're, you have a shareholders meeting in person and then there's a vote to amend it. But that's where the, that's the weakness of it, though, is, is that if you change the Constitution or if you, you change the Constitution and put all your rights in that, then... The other shareholders can all vote to change that constitution and you lose all your rights. Whereas if you have it in the shareholders agreement, it says that this agreement can't be amended without your approval, then all your rights are locked in there. Um, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.